Hello, Dr. D here with the Chapter 7 video, and today there will be blood. Uh, chapter 7 is interesting. It fascinates me sometimes what an author chooses to include and what they have to omit on a topic as vast as hematology or the study of blood. So today I plan to give you first um, a sort of clinical overview from my perspective of some of the things they talk about and then I'll flip back through the book with I hope you'll be patient with that and see if there are any words or terms that I need to try and pronounce for you or enlighten you about perhaps a bit. So let's start with a lab test that you are going to see over and over and over again Virtually every patient admitted to the hospital will have this test done. Many clinic patients will have this test done. And that is the CBC, or complete blood count. What does that mean? Well, we look at the different elements that make up a person's blood, and that helps us determine if they are well or sick, and if they are sick, what might be going on. So it's a test that gives us a lot of information. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking to you about a CBC. But first, let's talk about what makes up your blood. A large portion of your blood, over half, is made up of a solution of protein and water, along with some electrolytes, primarily salt, uh, and that's called plasma. So plasma makes up the yellow clear part of the blood that you see if you let blood sit in a container undisturbed for a bit. In healthcare, that's usually a red top tube. Some of you with clinical experience know that. A red top tube is simply a plastic or glass um, vial with a red top where we can put a small sample of blood and it doesn't have anything else in it. Uh, nothing to keep the blood from clotting specifically. So if we let that tube sit in a test tube rack overnight, the heavier parts will fall to the bottom and the yellow straw colored clear part, the plasma, will rise to the top. So in between the red stuff at the bottom, which is your red blood cells, and the clear plasma, there is a sort of foamy or shaggy looking cream colored part, thin layer called the buffy coat. And we'll talk about what makes up each of those uh, heavier components in just a moment. So when we draw a CBC, a complete blood count, that goes into a purple top tube that has um, something in it to keep the an anticoagulant, to keep the blood from clotting and settling out. Now with our red top tube, we could accelerate the process of it layering out by putting it in a centrifuge that spins it round and round. We don't do that with a purple top tube. One thing I always used to cringe is when somebody would pick up a purple top tube and shake it because you're going to break up red blood cells. And those of you who are studying phlebotomy already know, and with clinical experience, we mix it gently because we don't want to destroy any of those fragile components, cellular components within the blood. So let's say that we have our um, purple top tube and we want to know what's in it in a complete blood count. Well, the first thing we want to know is how good is this person's blood going to be at carrying oxygen? The red blood cells that make up most of the layer uh, at the bottom of a red top tube, those red blood cells are shaped like tiny little, a bit like bagels where the hole didn't go through. We say it's a biconcave disc. If you like Werther's, they kind of look like the hard Werther's candy. It's an interesting shape. Engineers have determined that it is ideal for allowing oxygen to go in and out of that cell. It's a very efficient shape for that, an interesting shape. So your red blood cells are like little vans or transporters for oxygen. So if you don't have enough, if you are anemic, you know that word, it means not enough red blood cells, then you might feel tired because your cells aren't getting enough oxygen to make ATP, to have energy. You might feel cold because that process of converting food to energy generates heat and requires oxygen. So if you don't have enough oxygen, you're not going to be very good at converting your food stuff into energy. You're not going to have a very big fire, if you want to think of it that way. And you're going to feel cold a lot of the time. You also might look pale because part of what gives our skin its pink tone 
is that we can see through the, the skin the little capillaries in the deeper layers of the skin that carry red blood cells. And so if a person is very pale, it might mean that they don't make enough red blood cells. It might mean that they've lost red blood cells through bleeding. So they look pale. A trauma victim may look very pale. And we describe that as pallor. That's one of the words in your um, text today. Pallor means paleness of the skin. Okay, back to your CBC. So in a CBC, one of the first things we want to know is how much oxygen carrying capacity. And we describe that in two ways. One is by weight, the unit, uh, how much weight per unit of blood, and that is your hemoglobin, HGB, we often abbreviate it. Um, so hemoglobin is the protein inside red blood cells that has a little bit of iron, an iron atom in it, that sort of acts like a car seat for oxygen. Oxygen can latch on to that um, iron, that iron atom in the uh, hemoglobin and get carried out to the tissues where it's needed. One thing we forget about sometimes with red blood cells is they also carry carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide can't ride in that special oxygen car seat. He has to kind of hang on to the fender. So he hangs on to the protein chain of the hemoglobin, not in not on the special part just for oxygen. But a good part of the, the excuse me, the carbon dioxide that needs to go back to the lungs to be got rid of, that rides back to the lungs also on your red blood cells. A lot of people forget about that feature. So it's important to have red blood cells and we can measure them, uh, the amount of oxygen carrying capacity either by hemoglobin, which is a unit of weight per volume, or hematocrit, which is a percentage of red blood cells uh, per unit of blood volume. Now, let me show you something that when I was first entered med school, I used to see these diagrams everywhere, written on discarded napkins, on the legs of scrubs, even after they'd been through the the uh, laundry at the hospital, and even written on people's hands and arms during rounds. You see this diagram, or you did back then everywhere, and I think you'll still see it. And it looks a little bit like this. I have such trouble situating this so you can see it. Let's try that. So you think, what on earth is that? Well, I'm going to fill it out as we go. It's a shorthand little diagram that keeps you from having to write so many um, abbreviations when you're trying to note a patient's CBC really quickly. For some of you, you might be seeing 12, 15 patients on a, on a set of rounds and you need to know everybody's CBC. You know, you got to have it when you're asked. So a quick way to write it without having to use a bunch of words is to get familiar with that diagram. You will not be tested on this. I'm just telling you because I wish somebody had told me sooner. So what we do with that is we write the hemoglobin and the hematocrit on the first part of this diagram. And I'm going to just think of somebody who's probably pretty much okay, and I'm going to write those. So it might look something like this. These are just made up numbers, but they're within the realm of I'm not too worried about it. Okay, nope, this side and that way. So you can see that I wrote 12.0 on the top. That's the person's hemoglobin. That's how many grams per deciliter. I'm not testing you on this, but that's a weight volume uh, or a weight measurement. Below that, the 37.3 is the hematocrit. That's the percentage in a certain unit of blood that is taken up by the red blood cells. That's hematocrit. Again, hemoglobin is weight. Hematocrit is percentage. And in a person, typically one is the hematocrit's about plus or minus, that's why I didn't make it perfect, three times the hemoglobin. If that ratio is very far off in either direction, as you get further along in your clinical career, that can be an important clue as to what might be wrong with someone. Men typically have a higher hemoglobin and hematocrit than do women, testosterone, uh, causes their bone marrow to make more hemoglobin per unit of blood. Uh, women tend to have a little less. So this is for a woman, something that's, I'd be happy to have that today. That, that would suit me fine. So that is the first thing we see when we look at a CBC, the hemoglobin and hematocrit. All right, there are some other things along the way that I'm going to come back and talk about in a minute. But the next thing we really look at is the total white blood count. Now you remember I told you that that buffy coat 
and there is a picture of that on page 148 in the um, the text here. You can see what I'm talking about there. So that is made up of white blood cells and platelets. White blood cells are part of your immune system. They're much smaller proportion of your blood than the red blood cells, but they are vitally important. So the total white blood count is the sum of all the different types of white blood cells, and we'll talk just briefly about those in a minute. But let's say this person's white blood count is 6,000. So you can write it either as 6,000 or 6K. We'll make it 6,400. So I'd probably write 6,400, but you could also write, if you wanted to, 6.4K. And notice, I don't already on this little diagram, I don't have to know, excuse me, come on, Karen, uh, I don't have to know what any of those things stand for because I'm always going to write this diagram in exactly the same way. So I don't have to write white blood cells or WBCs or total white count because I know that spot on this little diagram is always reserved for the total white blood count. Now, what types of cells make up that total white blood count? That's why we say a, C a CBC with differential or a complete blood count with differential. The differential means we're differentiating between the different kinds of white blood cells. So I always write those in the same order. And this little fan shape down the side over here is the different types of white blood cells. And again, I always write them in the same order. Now, different people use a different order, but most of us use about the same, about the same. So the first type of white blood cell that we're really concerned about is neutrophils. They are the most common, and they have a whole bunch of different names, frustratingly. They're also called polymorphonuclear cells, or PMNs, polymorphonucleate. We don't say that very often because it's too hard. <laughs> so PMNs, you hear them called that. You also hear them called very frequently SEGs, which is short for segmented neutrophils. Now let's face it, part of the reason we do this is because a lot of us were geeks in school and weren't cool. So now that we are cool doctors, we like to throw our slang around. So neutrophils sometimes get called newts. They sometimes get called PMNs. Sometimes they get called polys from the polymorphonuclear, and sometimes they get called SEGs. The nuclei of these white blood cells sort of look like a string of frankfurters, and it's a nucleus that has all different shapes, and they're joined together by little thin bands. And if we were in A&P, we would have fun looking at them under the microscope. I wish I could show you. So PMNs, uh, polys, SEGs, or just good old neutrophils. That suits me fine. And I'm going to say that this person, maybe me, and I, again, I'd be happy to have this blood count today, has, it's listed as a percentage. So this person has about 62% of their total white blood count is made up of neutrophils. If you wanted to remind yourself of that until you're real familiar with it, you could even put a little in. The next uh, type, most numerous type of cells in a typical CBC is lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, and I believe your book points this out, come in two forms, B cells and T cells. You can't tell by looking at them which are which. They don't wear little jerseys, but they have very different jobs. B cells are the cells that make antibodies, and with all the discussion of COVID, we we're all familiar with antibodies at this point. It's the job of B lymphocytes to make those. There are little factories for them. T cells have a lot of different jobs. They're often described as being the managers of the immune system. They're very important in fighting viruses. They activate a lot of complicated parts of the immune system. It's fascinating to learn about well beyond our scope. We can't differentiate them in routine CBCs and there's no need to. So let's say this person then has, let's say, I don't, I'm trying to make this come out right because it has to come out to 100 at the end. We're going to give them, yeah, we'll give them 28% lymphocytes. Not very good writing, but 28, that's an 8, you can't tell, but it's an 8. 28% lymphocytes. So we're up to 90% of the white blood cells. The other three types of white blood cells, 
They're, um, they're much smaller typically. Again, if they're elevated beyond what we'd expect, that's a really important clue about what might be going on. So I'm going to mention all three of them just quickly. The next most common type, but still a distinct minority typically, would be our uh, monocytes. And so I'm going to go ahead and finish these out. Okay. Fortunately, none of these start with the same letter. But again, I don't even usually write the letter because I know I'm always going to list the neutrophils first, then the lymphocytes, then the monocytes, then eosinophils, and lastly, basophils. Uh, I don't know how much you want to know about what those do. Monocytes, which we have seven of, those are often elevated in a new infection. Certain viral infections are characterized, and a few bacterial infections, by an abnormal increase in monocytes. Eosinophils, they modulate the allergic response, and they also uh, are elevated when we have a parasitic infection, although not pinworms, other kinds, hookworms, tapeworms, and so on. And basophils are cells that look like um, a cluster of grapes, purple grapes. It's kind of a big lumpy or a blackberry, a blackberry cell maybe, under the microscope. Those clusters, those um, granules on them, those big purple granules contain histamine. And everybody knows what an antihistamine is. And you think, oh, histamine, that's bad because we take drugs that are antihistamines. But if you study the immune system, you realize histamines really are on your side. We wouldn't have them. They just have sometimes troublesome and annoying side effects. So more about that when you study pharmacology and your anatomy and physiology. But for right now, what I want you to realize is that that number is the total white blood count, and the differential is the percentage of different white blood cells that make up that, um, that total white blood count. And then the last thing we list is platelets. Platelets aren't actually complete cells. They are uh, fragments of a bigger cell called a megakaryocyte. You don't have to know that for me. That breaks apart. And they act like little sticky notes, if you will. When I taught A&P, one thing we would do is I would ask someone to take some post-it notes and cover up a door, the opening in a doorway. Well, that's virtually impossible to do. But if you took some string and ran that across the doorway, up and down, or on the diagonal, if you made a web of string, then it was pretty easy to occlude the doorway with the sticky notes. Well, platelets are like the sticky notes in this illustration. Platelets are like little shingles or little patches or little band-aids, but they need something to hang on to. When your blood coagulates, when it clots, what happens is you make strings of a protein called fibrin, and then the platelets come in and hold on to that. If you look at a scab, and I know that sounds disgusting, but if you look at it, you can almost see, sometimes if you look closely or with a magnifying glass, the little strands of fibrin that the platelets have come and stuck onto to stop you from bleeding. So platelets are really important, and they're one of the first uh, numbers to go abnormal to an abnormal number when your bone marrow isn't working properly. If your bone marrow is shutting down, platelets drop pretty quickly because they don't live very long. They're just fragments of cells and they get used up pretty quickly because our bodies take a beating in everyday life. So platelets usually, depending on your lab, are somewhere between 200 and 400,000 per unit of blood that we're looking at. So let's just, I would write that usually, I'll just say this person has 3.2K. So if this were my blood count today, and we'll go over it one more time here, I would feel pretty good that I'm going to make it through the end of this lecture. Because first, I have a hemoglobin and a hematocrit, a total white blood cell count that helps me fight infections, and I know the types of cells. And this looks like a very typical normal day distribution of neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. I also write on the number under the white blood count, my platelet count, that's optional, but I said I had 3.2,000, 3,200 per, um, oh no, I, that's wrong actually, excuse me, it's not 3.2K, yeah, that's right, 3.2K, 320,000 per, um, per um, no, 320, I don't know why I wrote that, 
302, we'll say I have 322, that's normal too. So 322,000 per unit of blood. They're tiny, 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 hard to see with a typical microscope. So those are the items that make up a complete blood count. Now, let's look back through here and see what we may have missed that they want you to know. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Don't see anything clear. Erythrocyte is another name for red blood cell. It means literally red cells. So RBCs are erythrocytes, hemoglobin. Hypoxia means not enough oxygen. can be caused by a lot of things. It might be because somebody put um, masking tape over, or duct tape over your mouth and nose, or you put your head in a plastic bag. You'll get hypoxic. But you can also have tissue hypoxia, again, because you're severely anemic and no, not enough red cells are bringing you oxygen. Occult blood means blood that you, doesn't look red, that you can't see. Uh, we most commonly see that when we test a person's fecal material to see if there is a small amount of blood in there that might, might be due to, say, a colon cancer that we haven't uncovered yet. So occult blood means hidden blood, and there are tests we can do to make it show up. Pallor we talked about. Pernicious anemia is a certain type of anemia. It's where you can't complete the manufacture of blood cells because your body doesn't absorb B12. Uh, in the old days, before they knew that, people died from it. That's unusual this day. You may know some relatives, older relatives, who go to get their B12 shot at intervals once a month or whatever, and that's to help them not have pernicious anemia. Polycythemia means more than usual number of, of cells, usually means red blood cells. Poly, you remember, means many. Cyte means cells. So polycythemia means many-celled blood. Why would we get that? Well, if for some reason your body thinks, I'm not getting enough oxygen, it, one thing it can do, besides breathing faster, pumping harder, is to make more red blood cells. So if you were, went to live at high altitude for a while, your body, sensing the thinner air with less oxygen, would start to make more red blood cells. That's why some athletes like to train at high altitude so that when they return to uh, a lower altitude, they have more red blood cells. It's sort of a mild form and legal form of blood doping. Uh, it can also happen with people who smoke because when you smoke, your lungs tend not to work as well, your tissue doesn't get as much, um, as much oxygen, and your body responds by making more red blood cells. People who have some heart or lung disease will have polycythemia. You can also have polycythemia because your body just messes up and makes too many. They call it red blood cell cancer. It tends to run in families. Again, beyond the scope of our class today, but polycythemia vera is another condition where you have too many red blood cells. It's worrisome because when you have too many red blood cells, it's thicker and it can clot more easily, and that can lead to strokes, heart attacks, and so on. Coming on. Aplastic anemia, a really bad thing. Let's not get that today. Aplastic means you aren't making it. So if your bone marrow shuts down, you stop making all the elements that make up blood. The platelets usually show up first in, by their absence, so the person might have either little red hemorrhages like that look like red freckles called petechiae. You may have heard that term or they may start to bruise or even have frank bleeding from their gums or their nose. Uh, also, very quickly become vulnerable to infection because we don't make white blood cells and will become anemic. So aplastic anemia, that's a bad thing. Lots of times we don't know what causes it, but there are certain uh, chemicals and even certain drugs that are known to be associated with aplastic anemia. Oh, leukocytes, another name for white blood cells. White blood cells, they have the word granulocyte here. They can be divided in, and we're not going to go into all that, don't worry, into uh, white cells, leukocytes that have granules under the microscope, and those that don't, the ones that don't, are called agranulocytes. It, it was a term that the early cytologists used to differentiate, but it turns out that it doesn't really have a lot to do with where the cells or how the cells formed in your bone marrow. So it's um, sort of an antique term, but we still use it. When we say granulocytes, most often we're talking about neutrophils because they are the overwhelming majority.
Hemolysis is a term you will hear. That's when red blood cells break apart. And a lot of things can cause hemolysis. Some infections can cause it. Uh, certain drugs can cause it. We can inadvertently cause it by putting a solution that's too dilute through somebody's IV so the red cells burst. So hemolysis means red blood cells rupturing and anemias associated with that are called hemolytic anemias. So there's another word. I'm just making sure we're covering most of these. Um, leukemia, I think everyone knows what that is, a cancer of the bone marrow where you produce abnormal numbers and types of white blood cells. There are several kinds of leukemia from very treatable to not very treatable. A hematoma is another word for bruise. It's a collection of blood within the skin. If your child, your toddler falls and gets what we call a pump knot, a goose egg here on the forehead, that's a hematoma. Pinsidopenia, pump ramen, brands. We'll get to those in a minute. We'll talk about it now. Clotting. Clotting is an interesting process. It's amazing that we don't all bleed to death all the time because our bodies get cut all the time. Every time you eat, as your food goes through your alimentary tract, every time you bump into something, most of the time we don't even know because it's the microscopic level and the bleeding is taken care of almost immediately. Even fairly pronounced bleeding, your body's pretty good at dealing with. So there's really um, three steps to... Um, uh, stopping bleeding, if you will, that's called hemostasis, hemo blood stasis stops, so hemostasis. First, when you cut yourself, even at the microscopic level, blood vessels constrict. It's like, oh no, we're losing blood, so they clamp down. There's muscles in the walls of your little blood vessels, and they try to stop the bleeding. That's a very temporary measure. You may have witnessed it. You feel that knife go through your fingertip in the kitchen, and you think, oh, maybe it's not that bad. And then after just a few seconds, you realize, oh, yeah, it is that bad. The reason you have that moment of hope that you haven't cut yourself very badly is because of that vasospasm, the blood vessels constrict. Then your blood has within it proteins that when activated by the cut can form those strings or strands of fibrin that I told you about. And then the platelets can come in and plug up the opening by sticking to the fibrin strands. Now that is an oversimplification of what happens, but it'll do fine for us right now. An anticoagulant like heparin, um, that is a drug that keeps that process from happening to the typical degree. And depending on how much you give, you can stop hemostasis almost entirely. You make the blood really, quote, thin is what lay people call it. They're blood thinner. Or you can just use a little bit to keep someone with, say, the AFib we talked about from having a clot develop in their atrium. It's a, it's a complicated topic. People who have hemophilia they are missing one of the critical factors that leads to the fibrin, the string formation, and there are different kinds of hemophilia. And we can give them replacement of the factor that they're missing. There are other uh, problems like von Willebrand disease where your platelets aren't sticky enough. By taking aspirin or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, you can make your platelets less sticky. That's why if you've had planned surgery, they tell you to quit taking those drugs in advance of that kind of procedure. Purpura is mentioned. That is a purplish bruise where, where you can see, um, um, they say, yeah, skin hemorrhages that are red and then turn purple, what you think of as a bruise. Petechia, petechiae is the plural. Those are the little red freckles from tiny capillary hemorrhages that we talked about. RH factor. Boy, your book goes into blood types. We're covering it all in one little chapter. But RH factor is rhesus factor because it was found in rhesus monkeys. That tells you if your blood type is positive or negative. The, it's completely separate from the other four blood types, A, B, O, or AB. Those are, And we're not going to go into all the different blood types and how it works genetically and who can get what from whom, but there are four blood types that are genetically determined and each of them has a positive and a negative um, type as well. The two things are completely separate, but we usually say, like I'm O positive, very common. My husband is O negative, not as common. They like to get his blood for transfusing. Uh, other terms in here that you might want to know. Ah, 
macrocyte and microcyte, and we see those more in the, I'm glad it just came up, um, in the adjective form, macrocytic or microcytic. So here's a little tip, again, not in your book, not to be tested on, but it may keep you from feeling silly at some point. If you are going into nursing or some other kind of healthcare where you do shift work, and you're going to be looking at patients' labs as they come back and then relaying that information to a doctor or other healthcare professionals. What tends to happen is the newest people get put on by themselves at night. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So typically what will happen is a physician or a nurse practitioner or another practitioner will call the hospital and say, uh, tell me when Ms. Jones' CBC comes back. So the CBC comes back, the computer printer spits it out, you've got this long list of stuff in a CBC. Because there are a lot of components in a CBC, and I have a video about this attached to this chapter that we didn't talk about just now. A hematologist and other people in some circumstances may want to know every single one of those things, but typically when we're asking, we want to know the things I just showed you on that little diagram. We want to know the H and H, the WBCs, the white blood count, the platelet count, and probably, possibly, the differential. So, what are those other things you might see? Well, if you look at your book, it has them all listed. You might want to know the red cell diameter, like how big do they measure? Are they big, macrocytic, or little, microcytic? You might want to know the MCHC, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Another word for red blood, red blood cells is red corpuscles, kind of an antique term. So you might want to know that. But typically, if we're calling back to see how our post-op patient is doing or the child that was just admitted with an infection, well, we don't need to know all that. But when it spits out on the lab report, it has all that stuff. So what you'll see is experienced people will immediately say the H&H &H is, you know, 12 and 36, and the white blood count is 10,000, and they're 70% neutrophils. So that's what the provider wants to know, and they'll ask you more if they want to know. But if they are half asleep and you start saying, in the red cell with this and the, the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is, they're going to say cut to the chase. So that's just a little tip that might make things less awkward, not germane to, to this stuff in the book. Um, da -da -da -da. Then the book goes into the lymphatic system, and you can look at that. I am not going to go there. They want to tell you all about immunity. It's fascinating. COVID has provided a, uh, an opportunity, if you will, for almost everyone to learn something about antigens and antibodies and how all that works. Uh, again, beyond the scope of our class here today. So I'm going to quit because it's time to. Uh, but I hope that maybe you've learned something you can take with you. If you have questions, you know how to reach me by email. Thanks for putting up with me.